You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll discuss what the future holds for West Africa's cocoa industry. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market, and you can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther O. Awuni. Now, recent agreement for a minimum floor price of $2,600 per ton for buyers of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire's cocoa will see farmers get a little more from the cocoa industry. Akin Laoye, executive director of FTN Cocoa Processors, and Raphael Dapper, founding director of Dapper Group, join me as we explore on the future of West Africa's cocoa industry. Now, Raphael joins us via Skype from London. Now, let's kick off with this new agreement. Now, conversations about the imbalance between what cocoa farmers in West Africa make versus you know, the big commodity uh, dealers or buyers. I mean, this has been a conversation we've had for a very long time. So I'm just curious to know what moved the needle now with this agreement to have it to set the price at $2,600 per ton? I think it's been a long time in the making. Um, there's been a generational disparity of wealth between, as you put it, the cocoa merchants, the global cocoa, um, cocoa merchants, as well as the um, cocoa producing farmers in countries like Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. So it's been a long time in the making, but I feel this current administration, and particularly in Ghana, have been adamant that Ghana should be price makers as opposed to price takers. And I think it's this sense of confidence and um, you know this vision that Ghana should be beyond aid that has really um, driven this decision to come about. And of course, um, also the need to collaborate with our neighbours, of course, Cote d'Ivoire being just next door to us. Um, I think Ghana's current administration has seen strength in solidarity and coming together. And I think that's what's really driven this change. So it's extremely positive and we couldn't be prouder of um, the recent decision. Now, before I bring in Akin, just one more question for you, Raphael. What factors were taken into consideration in arriving at this price? We know that we've seen some volatility at the, at the, or at the cocoa market. Sometimes prices are high, sometimes they're low. But at this price, I'm just wondering, what was taken into consideration in arriving at, the, at it? I think it was just generally the fact that it's generally accepted that our cocoa farmers haven't received a fair due. Um, and as you put it, prices have fluctuated for years. So I think this was just the median price that all parties were happy to come um, to agreement on. However, I do think there is still more room and more flexibility for a greater price to be agreed, agreed in future. But I think this is definitely a step in the right direction. All right, hold that thought for us. Uh, okay, let me bring you in here. I mean, I'm, Raphael just said that there's actually more more room in the future to, you know, for a price hike. But I want to get your your uh, your input here. You're uh, a player in Nigeria's cocoa industry. What do you make of this new agreement, 2,600 uh, per ton? Well, um, talking about the farmers, it's good for it to be an incentive for people to see that they're getting value for what they produce. But my concern is that um, we need to know the mechanisms. It has to be clear enough, and uh, we have to be sure that it is sustainable because um, we are all used to the market forces uh, as a price determinant in the marketplace. Now, uh, how will they be fixing this price? What are the things that make, will make them fix it? These are the things that we need to know. Otherwise, um, it might go the route of what happened in Central America in the 80s when there was price fixing like this for coffee, yeah. and at the end of the day, it didn't work and they return, they return to the status quo. So, I mean, we got to look at that and uh, make sure that uh, this piece is, is very clear to the whole world and clear to the operators. And once that is in place, then it can be sustained. But do you think the market might push back? I mean, the buyers might say, look, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is the way market work. We need uh, market forces to determine prices in the first place. So we're not sure if this is going to work on for us too as buyers of the commodity. Exactly. That's the thing. We expect the, there, should be, there will be some pushback, no doubt, because some people will be deprived of value, and so there will be some reactions. So the question is, how, source, how what's the will that we are putting into this thing? Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and indeed other African countries that will join, they must have the will to say we will keep this at this. And that means you have to consider a lot of things. You have to consider the fate of the farmers, because if you say you want to sustain it, you want to do, go on this kind of war, um, would you be able to sustain those guys who already live their life on the cocoa they make every year, which is seasonal? How would they be sustained? 
Okay, government is, ag is aggregating this cocoa. I, is government able? Do they have what it takes? Do they have enough reserve to be able to sustain the farmers when the waiting game is on or when the battle is going on? Okay. Those are the issues I think um, must be very clear. Because, you see, uh, government is not the farmer. So, uh, so the government must be able to do things to make sure that those okay. guys, their income stream is not blocked. Now, Raphael, what do, you, what do you think about Akin's response I mean, and the fact that there could actually be a pushback from the market? I think that's inevitable, especially when you have ne negotiations going on. Um, you know, parties work in their own interests and want to serve their own interests and make as much as possible. But I think if we look at the global value chain for the cocoa industry, if you look at just the fact that the chocolate industry is worth about $100 billion, and yet countries like Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire receive just about 2% of that, I think there's enough room to be able to negotiate this minimum floor price and sustain it. Um, there's clearly enough room if you've got the top players like Nestle and Kraft and Mondela's group making such, you know, dare I say extortionate amounts where you have cocoa farmers who are still living in poverty despite being the considerable contributors to this um, trade in this industry. So I think there's a lot more room that can be negotiated and I do think there's a political will and a political appetite to sustain this minimum floor price. I think at the moment the ball really is in the court of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire's government and I do think they do have this um, political will and um, the agitation from farmers to ensure that this is sustained. Now, is it though? Because, you know, I was having a conversation with Akin earlier and we're talking about, you know, how advanced the processing capability of these big players are, especially you just mentioned a couple of names now. What if they decide to wait this out? I mean, if they have uh, ample storage and decide that, look, this price is not, uh, we, we do not agree to this price, we want something lower or even much lower and decide to wait it out, what happens then? They could decide to wait it out, but I highly doubt that would happen. I mean, we've, we've mentioned that Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire collectively contribute 60% of the global trade. So to wait it out, whilst it could be a calculated risk, I think is one that would backfire. And I don't think they would want to take that chance. Okay. So at the moment, it seems as though they're willing to negotiate. And from what I last gathered, they have been um, ag um, agreed that the minimum price should be raised. And that for me shows that um, they agree that there's a lot more room that can be negotiated and made. Okay. I can let me bring you in here. For Nigeria, I mean, you're a player, you're watching. I, mean, I suppose other players in Nigeria are also watching. What does this mean for Nigeria? How do we get onto this, you know, this uh, well, band, uh, this, thing, this <laughs> train that's uh, well, taken off? definitely as trust Nigeria. Nigeria will latch in um, immediately. And um, the good side, thinking about it, is that uh, once it becomes obvious this way, the farmers have so much knowledge and um, the kind of uh, advantage the local buying agents are having uh, over the farmers might change. I see that it can be a game changer for the way the market plays out here in Nigeria. Because you see, right now in Nigeria, because our market is deregulated, um, the value chain is the farm, then the local buying agents, the merchants, and the users, and I mean, including exporters and everything. So, we discovered that the local buying agents are the ones making most the money most because the farmers are you know they are low in capital most times they will advance money to these guys and then they will determine they will tell them the price they're going to take it from the farm gate and then they will now react to the international market price and make people like us to compel us to buy from the international market price. So, so they that's, have a that's huge already a huge distortion, even oh, sure, from outside sure. domestically. Yeah. So that's I mean, what we've been that saying. Been exactly. Out of the way. So this kind of a thing can also, um, you know, help us here. The farmers will get to know, and then they will insist that this is the price they want, and then can also trigger uh, the appetite of people to go back to the farm. Now, in, in the meantime, what we're also hearing is that uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have suspended forward sales of cocoa beans for the 2020-2021 season until uh, this floor price is agreed to. Yes. And then uh, when Raphael says that he believes that there's actually more room for a higher... No, true. There is more price. room. There's no doubt about it. It is the political will okay. for these guys to be able to sustain this war. That's what we're talking about here. There's room. Even in Nigeria, we see there's room. We have people like Nestle. We have people, you, you know, all these producers of beverage. If, at the end of the day, if you look at uh, what they sell their product and what even people like us okay. sell to them, there's so much room for them to make money. So okay, I believe that... Um, at the end of the day, with a strong political will and the willingness to go to the negotiating table, we should be able to get somewhere. And a lot of the farmers will be 
better than what it was before. Uh, of course, that negotiating table uh, is, uh, has been slated for July 3rd to address details of uh, its implementation. Rafael, let me bring you in here. We've talked a lot about on the side of, uh, I mean, the, what the farmers earn or need to earn in terms of uh, improving their livelihood. But before now, conversations have been the approach or to the solution for these uh, farmers has been the side of productivity, getting them to increase uh, more productivity. Do you think that we can now, for once, balance it out? Yes, focus on how we can make these farmers you know, more productive, you know, get more cocoa mm -hmm. out uh, in a sustainable manner, at the same time, give them decent wages. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, respectively, have actually been overproducing um, their cocoa, which is what has, I think, historically um, suppressed some of the um, the cocoa price because there's been an oversupply of the cocoa. So uh, at the moment, I don't think there's this need or an incentive to increase production as much. Um, but I think generally, you know, the Ghanaian government and the Cote d'Ivoire government, respectively, you know, I think what really needs to be done here, and I, I, I view this as a stepping stage to a bigger picture. We are commanding a greater price for our cocoa. Okay. What we also need to be discussing is how we can further add value to, to our cocoa to really increase the livelihoods of our farmers. Just as an example, when I buy cocoa from our farmers in our farms in Ghana, we actually buy our cocoa at a premium rate because the farmers actually process the cocoa beans for us. So they're not just exporting whole beans, they're importing, they're exporting crushed beans. And in doing so, they're adding value, they're processing the cocoa, and therefore they can demand a higher price. So I think this is just a stepping stone. It's brilliant that we're talking about negotiating a minimum floor price, but I think later on, we really need to start discussing how can we add value? How can we mm -hmm. take more control of the value chain? And, you know, this is just the beginning of what I think will be a beneficial arrangement for Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and hopefully Nigeria as well. Okay. Well, thank you for your time so far, Rafael. We're just going to take a short break at this point. We'll come back and, uh, and talk about value addition. I've been speaking to Aki Laie, Executive Director of FTN Cocoa Processors, and Rafael Dapper, founder, Founding Director of Dapper Group, joining us via Skype from London. We'll be right back after this short break to join us again. If you're just joining us, Aki Laie, Executive Director of FTN Cocoa Processors, and Rafael Dapper, Founding Director of Dapper Group, are with me today, and we're discussing the future of West Africa's cocoa industry. Thank you for your time so far. You. Let's pick up from where we left off. Now, I've heard experts say that the only way, that value addition is the only way African cocoa producers can have a say in the market. Now, of course, you've made that point uh, while we are discussing before we came on. Uh, Raphael has also made that point. How do we begin to add value? What are those necessary investments that need to be made, especially perhaps with a combination of both the government and the private sector, to add more value to this product? Uh, well, the first thing has to do with the basic infrastructure. Um, let me take Nigeria as an example. Uh, we have a, a huge infrastructure gap. So if you really want to trigger investors coming into that sector space, um, government needs to do a lot of things. Otherwise, it becomes prohibitive in terms of cost. One of our keyest problems in Nigeria, for example, is power. We spend so much. In our factory, we do about 200 million, 250 million per annum for power. Now, if we have good government public power, it will not be as difficult as that. That kind of money can be plowed back. So it makes it unattractive kind of, on top of huge cost of money. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Ghana is a bit a step ahead of us when it comes to that. They have, uh, they have, I understand the power in Ghana is much better. Same thing in uh, Ivory Coast. So once they are in the, in, in the, in, in the right direction, now the other is aspect has to do with the cost of money. Uh, what's the cost of funding which these guys will use to go into the business? That's why we are not competitive with what yeah. is going on in Europe. It's not because we cannot do what they are doing in America or Europe. It's the same machine. And of course, we are, we are very close to the farm. So it means that we can even have the best in terms of uh, value addition. But because of this cost, it becomes so prohibitive. And then people don't, investors don't feel excited going to that space. But now, if the farmers are getting good revenue, good income, you know, something decent, and this also, you know, uh, goes to the hands of uh, the processors. Many people would like to come. For goodness sake, all these guys producing, uh, you know, uh, mass chocolates and everything, why can't they just take the intermediate product from Africa? And that will deepen our industrial base. 
you know, and uh, over the time we'll, we'll get better because maybe the first issue will be what's the quality of what we are doing. Mm. This quality can be addressed, you know. So I think um, for, for us it is to just make sure the infrastructure uh, gaps are closed, ability to access funds. So by, obviously, by policy, to, obviously it has, to be, policy, policies, has yes. to be policy enabled. Yeah, yeah. But are those conversations already ongoing? Well, we've been talking to government and um, on paper, they talk about policies. We hear of export stimulation funds and everything, but these things are not easy to come by. They are just uh, too many bottlenecks as far as Nigeria is concerned. It's making it so hard because today we have about eight processing factories. Maybe three and a half is working. So is there, is there a chance that this can be a missed opportunity for, for Nigeria? I mean, we're hoping that this can be sustained, but obviously getting on it as quickly as possible. Will be, will be beneficial for the it Nigerian will, Yeah, it will Cocoa be. Market. And of course, government in Nigeria too will immediately see how best to go about that sector. Because you see, the problem we've been having is confusing signals. Um, in Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire, they have gone ahead of us in terms of making sure they deepen the processing. For example, in Ghana, if you're a processor, you have access to cocoa. And um, working capital is not a major problem like we compared to Nigeria. In Nigeria, it's not like that. We are competing with the merchants. They come with low-cost uh, funds to, 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 to compete with us. So many of the times, these guys will give the LBAs money in advance, okay. and those ones will advance the farmers, and that's why there's so much distortion, you know. Oh, Rafael, let me bring you in here. Now, the, the two biggest producers, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, they've come together. They found a political will to come together to set this floor price. Uh, but what about the political will to, you know, to add value to this commodity? What are your thoughts in terms of how, uh, if you see this country these countries you know, coming together also to talk about and to also take decisive action on adding value to this commodity. Absolutely, which is why I said this negotiation is just a stepping stone. Um, the real discussion that needs to be had is industrializing and um, to the gentleman's point, that includes obviously processing our cocoa and of course we know there are infrastructural challenges around that, not to mention power shortages, but this is something that can be addressed. At the moment, I can only speak to Ghana's um, government, but they have implemented a policy known as One District, One Factory, which is essentially this need and this understanding that Ghana needs to industrialize in order to really take control of the value chain. So, for example, in the western region of Ghana, which is known for producing the best cocoa, and which is where I source my cocoa from, we actually have plans to build a factory there so we can actually process the cocoa we export to the United Kingdom, add value and create jobs and opportunities for the cocoa growing communities. So these things can be done. And of course, when you have the support of the public sector, the government, it definitely goes a long way. But as the gentleman added, um, access to finance and capital and of course mitigating the infrastructural challenges is something that also needs to be addressed. And I think um, it's a conversation that can be had with the people we're trading with. So, for example, if Kraft and Nestle want to do business in Ghana, we should also be able to determine terms such as if you want to buy from us, you also need to be in a position to perhaps establish a factory down the, um, down the line in Ghana in order to do business with us. I think we really need to play our hand and recognize our strengths. You know, the ball really is in our court, and I think we need to begin to really leverage that. So I think I, I, I'm really optimistic about what the future holds in terms of um, Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, and West Africa at large being able to really determine um, how to industrialize and, and holding their partners um, outside of, of Africa to account in order to really empower and their respective nations. Okay, uh, Rafi, I just want to quickly squeeze in one more question for you before I, I, I turn to Aki. Now, it's been said that Africa consu consumes very little cocoa. How do we begin to stimulate local consumption, even here on the African continent, you know, while we you know, have discussions about, you know, increasing production and getting these big players outside of, of the continent to come establish factories here? I think, if anything, that comes with um, smart and strategic marketing. I, in Ghana, I do know we, we consume a lot of chocolate. However, it's not the typical chocolate that's consumed um, in Western Europe or America. Um, ours is a different sort of um, variety. So I think it's all about smart marketing, you know, promoting our chocolate brands and, and showing that they are as competitive with um, chocolate that's produced in the West. Because what I find is 
there is the appetite for consuming of chocolate. However, we import a lot of the chocolate um, from the West. So we export the cocoa and then we import the processed or the finished product. So what we really need to do is champion our local um, chocolate um, industry. And that comes again with more players entering the chocolate industry and deciding to take control of the value chain. And that's exactly what the Par Group aimed to do. We were processing our cocoa to the finished product, dapper okay. chocolates. So we are, we're hoping um, local consumers will um, latch on to what we're producing and see that our quality rivals anyone across the globe. Okay. Now, Ake, you know, when we talk about cocoa, we always mention chocolates. I mean, I imagine that there are other derivatives from yeah, this commodity. Yeah. I mean, are, are, those, are there other areas of you know, byproducts that we explore or could explore? Yeah, sure. I mean, apart from chocolates, you have cosmetics, you can do wine, you can go into other confectionaries like uh, baking and all those things. So there are lots that can be done from um, the use of uh, cocoa products. You know, so what government needs to really do is to, number one, everybody will take cocoa, to be honest. Everybody will take chocolate. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we are having low demand here is because of the buying power. It's a bit expensive, Baba for people to consume. And mostly now, because that is it's imported anyways. Yes. Uh, and even if you look at the current pricing, okay. today butter is about $5,500 per ton. Uh, that's not cheap if you want to produce, make a product. So uh, I think government can uh, stimulate demands like what we are doing in Nigeria, the school feeding program. I'm so proud of a company in Ghana, Niche Coco. Uh, government is really backing them up. They have grown phenomenally in the past years. Uh, because that factory is a processing factory that is now producing products. And I understand they are also doing school, feed, school feeding program, things like that. These are the things government can do, you know. And um, with that, people will demand it. Cocoa, I mean, uh, wine factories, like the ban Nigeria is trying to impose on certain items, will make people look inwards and see what they can do. You can produce gin from cocoa. You can produce Drink wine course. from cocoa. You can do cosmetics for beauty yeah. cream and all those things from cocoa and many other things ice cream, just name it, apart from the basic chocolate. So mm. there are a lot we can do. Well, you know, it's also been said that uh, the, the future of, you know, the, 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 the cocoa no longer offers an appealing future. Because when you look at so many of the farmers here in Africa, they're aging, and the younger farmers are not too keen to come on board. Yeah. With this happening now, if it does, if it sticks, you know, if, if, it, if it all works out, do you see that changing? Yes, I see it changing. Because the truth is, most of the younger farmers don't even know the economics. That's the reason why they are shying away from it. If you have a cocoa tree, if you plant the cocoa tree today, in another two years it starts fruiting. It can fruit for 50 years. Mm. So you have money to make. But because of this instant gratification syndrome that mm. is across the world, uh, some of these people are not seeing it that way. This can probably be an immediate trigger that can make that where the appetite. And when they get in, they will see that once you plant it, in the next 50 years, what you need is maintenance. Okay, Rafael, let me bring you in here. Uh, final point. Uh, I mean, are you optimistic about the future? I, I mean, I just asked Akin that, you know, it's many people no longer see it as an appealing uh, place, you know, to, to, yeah. to make a living. Do you think that that could change? Do you think that we could have younger cocoa farmers coming on board? Absolutely. I mean, of course, the incentive is more money, better incomes. So, again, we've now, we're now negotiating, negotiating the minimum floor price. And again, if there is more room for that to increase, you're going to incentivize younger people to pursue um, um, jobs in becoming cocoa farmers and what have you. But again, if we're also going to industrialize and create opportunities through processing our cocoa, so for example, young people becoming employees and factories that process cocoa, then there's more opportunities for young people to pursue um, entering the cocoa sector, whether it's from the grassroots as a farmer or whether it's through processing. So right. I'm absolutely optimistic for the future and I think, you know, there's so much to be gained. All right. Thank you so much, Rafael. We appreciate your time today. I've been speaking to uh, my guest today, Akin Lawyer, Executive Director of FTN Cocoa Processors, and Rafael Dapper, the founding director of DAPA Group, looking at the future of West Africa's cocoa industry. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. But remember that you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African time daily and have access to all previous episodes of Beyond Markets on our website. It's cnbcafrica.com, and you can stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets. And, of course, you can follow my Twitter handle, too, at Esther O. Awoni. For myself and the team, it's bye for now. Mm -hmm.